About a year ago, I made two different tutorials. One showing you how to incrementally rotate some tables for the building series I originally did in 5.3, and that used custom PCG nodes. And another tutorial where I showed you how to spawn props on top of tables. While you could absolutely still use both of those methods today, there are just better ways of doing it. And so by following this tutorial, you'll see how you can very easily here change the increment that you want to snap things to, whether it be 90, 45, or you could even go as any value at all, five degree increments. You can populate the, the things you want to spawn on top of. And of course you can change the distance between them if you want fewer or more, but that one's kind of a gimme. So with that, let me show you how it's all set up. To get started, you need to of course, make sure you have PCG turned on by going to your plugins and searching for PCG and turning on procedural content generation framework, PCG, make sure that is on and restart your engine as needed. Now we're gonna spawn these from a spline. So I'm gonna create a blueprint actor. I'll just call it BP underscore tables. And I'll also go ahead and right click and grab ourselves a PCG graph. Also PCG underscore tables. Now open up the BP tables and we're gonna add a couple of components starting with a simple spline. And once that's added, we'll go ahead and just drag it out a little bit and hold the alt button to drag out a few extra points. And then in the detail panel, we'll search for close, get ourselves a closed loop and make sure that is on. So we have a nice interior we can populate inside of. I'm gonna right click on one of the points. I'm going to select spline points all and then right click on it again and do spline pointing type linear. This will just help me to populate the tables where I want them. After this, we'll go ahead and add another component. This is going to be a PCG component. And all we need to do is plug in our graph in the instance here in the detail panel. And that's all we need here. Afterwards, you can go ahead and open up the actual graph. The first thing we're gonna be doing is actually setting up the tables, make sure they can spawn, be able to select the table meshes and be able to actually just rotate them in an incremental fashion. So if you want them to rotate in 45 degree increments, 10 degree increments, five degree increments, whatever you'd like, we will have control over that. So let's get that set up first and then we'll populate the things on top of it. So in the graph, I'm going to grab ourselves a get spline data node, and then I'll drag out and grab ourselves a spline sampler. And in the spline sampler, we're gonna change it to on interior. And you wanna make sure you have unbounded checked on. Now the interior sample spacing is really how far apart do you want these tables to be? And honestly, I kind of wanna control this. So what I'm gonna do is deselect the spline sampler. And then in the parameter section, I'm going to add a new variable. And this is going to be of a type float. That is fine. We're just going to rename it to distance between tables. And we'll set it to be something like 200 by default. Now I can open up my spline sampler and we have the interior sample spacing right over here at the bottom. So I'll go ahead and right click and search for get distance between tables and plug that into our interior sample spacing. And now we have the control for the distance. So at this point already, if I wanted to, I can go ahead and use a static mesh spawner and populate the mesh arrays in here and set everything up. But we want to actually be able to swap what tables or what meshes we want to actually have things populate on top of. So it's not hard coded in here. So instead of the static mesh spawner, we're not gonna use that yet. First, I'm gonna have everything deselected. I'm gonna add one more parameter. I'm going to change the type on it to be a static mesh. And we wanna select a static mesh object reference. And we also wanna change it from a single to an array. And we'll go ahead and rename these to mesh. And now here I can populate the meshes that I want here by default. So I have three different kinds of tables here. I've gone ahead and populated them in. That should be good enough for us. And now what we can do is right click and search for get mesh. And then we're gonna drag out of the spline sampler and we're gonna search for match and set attributes. And the match data is going to be our mesh. And you don't need to change anything on here. By default, this is good enough. It will give us a mesh attribute added onto it. But now we can already use a static mesh spawner. We just need to change the type here from selector weighted to by attribute. And the attribute name will be mesh because that is the name we gave it. And we'll plug it in all the way through. At this point, I can go ahead and drag out the tables. And you can see, there we go. We already have our tables randomly spawning. As you see here, I can drag it out into be a little bit larger and we now have the table spawning. Great, so now we can go ahead and start rotating them randomly, let's say by 45 degree increments or 90 degree increments, whatever we'd like. To do that, we will need a new PCG graph. So I'm gonna right click, grab ourselves a new PCG graph. This is going to be our PCG loop incremental rotation. And I'll open up the loop graph. For the input, I have it set to loop 
point and required for the first one. And the second one is a normal attribute set that is also required. And I've named the attribute set to rotation increment. The output is just a simple point that is of status normal. So with that, we can go ahead and get started. Now we're going to need access to this rotation increment. Instead of dragging it all over the place, I'm going to just drag it out right over here and then search for name, get a named reroute declaration node. And then I will press F2 on my keyboard to rename it to rotation increment. So that way we don't have to drag it out all over the place. So the main thing we're gonna need to do is use a transform points node. So we'll go ahead and grab that. And we'll put the transform points node right between the input and the output, and we'll open it up. Now there'll be quite a few things here in between the two, so I'll just drag it to the right. And now we can put all of our information here. And we need to randomize the actual rotation on all of them. So to do that, I'm gonna use density. Now I'm going to be setting up random density before this loop, so in this loop, I can go ahead and assume that density is already between zero and one randomly, so we can use it. So I'll drag out from the in and grab ourselves a get attribute from point index. And in the input source, we're gonna change it to be density right here on top. And then I want to multiply that using a create attribute set to 360. So what we're doing is we're taking the density that's between zero and one, and we're multiplying it by 360 so you get a value randomly between 0 and 360. But now we need to make sure that it is locked to the rotation increment. So what we're going to do is take it and then divide it by our rotation increment. And we can get it by right clicking as a string for rotation increment and then plugging it into B here. Now this will give us a decimal point in many cases, so we don't want it that. So after the divide, I'll use a floor node, which basically removes the decimal points and rounds it down. So if it was 100.5, it would be 100 now. So now after we have this floor, we just do multiply by our rotation increment. So I'll go ahead and drag out, grab ourselves a multiply node, and then we can go ahead and multiply it by this rotation increment, which I can grab right over here. After that, we just need to plug this in basically, but we can't plug it in directly. If you plugged it now, it would actually upside into all three axes. and We just want to do the rotation along the Z axis. So all you need to do is right click and search for make rot for make rotator and get the one from angles. Make rot from angles, the top one here. And this multiply will go into the yaw. And then the output here can go into rotation min and rotation max. Now, if you hover over this roll pitch yaw, it will tell you that the pin is optional. It will use the default value if not connected, which is zero. Don't believe it. It is a lie. It is false advertising. For whatever reason, it is currently bugged that if you don't plug anything into it, it will just not work. The easy solution is to just do a create attribute with a value of zero and plug that into both roll and pitch, and then you will have no problems. This is specifically with a make rotator attribute. The make vector attribute works just fine. But now we can go ahead and close this up, and then we're all done here. So now back in our main graph here in the PCG tables graph, we can go ahead and start using the actual density and this loop node. I'm going to move all of this over to the right. After the spline sampler, I'll go ahead and grab ourselves a density noise, which is just an attribute noise automatically set up for density for convenience. And then I want to use an attribute partition, and this will partition all of the points so it splits them up into their own data. In the detail panel, we just need to change last here to be index. And now we can take our PCG loop, drag it over, let go and select the loop node, the bottom option here, to create a loop of our system. So the attribute partition will go inside here. And now we need a rotation increment. So I'll go ahead and deselect it and add ourselves a new parameter here. I'll go ahead and rename it to rotation increment and we'll set it up to be 90 degrees by default. I'll right click and then get rotation increment, plug that into rotation increment, and then this can then go back into match and set attributes. And now if we take a look in our actual environment, you can see the tables have rotated. Some of them rotated sideways, some of them rotated forward, and judging by, by these ones, you can see some of them are rotated 90 degrees this way, 90 degrees that way. So we have all sorts of rotations here. And if you want to, we can go ahead and select it, scroll down to the PCG graph here, go to the parameter overrides, and then overrides the rotation increment to be something like 45 degrees, and now we have them snapping to 45 degree increments. And I can randomize the seed and get, of course, different variations here. So now we want to populate things on top of these tables. I want to put some plates on there. We've put these out in a restaurant and now we want plates on. But before, in the previous way I was doing it, it was using ray casting. It was a little very complex. You had to cut it out. And some parts of it you still have to do, but you don't have to do ray casts anymore. 
And we actually can make use of splines. And be wondering, well, how do we populate splines on top of the tables? Well, let me show you. So this right here is one of the tables I have. And what we want to do is specify that we want to place things right here in the middle. And to do that, here in the top right corner, right next to the detail panel, you have the socket manager. Now, if you don't have it here, you might have moved it or closed it. If you did, just go to window socket manager to reopen it. And we're going to add some sockets. So I'm going to add a new socket here. And then I want to move it on top of the table. Now, because the table is flat on top, we can see here in the top left corner, the approximate size of it is 69 by 69 by 49. So the height is 49. So I'll go ahead and take the relative location to 49. And now I can go ahead and move it kind of in the corner here. Now, I don't want to move it all the way into the corner. And that's because we're going to be randomly moving it just a bit. And so I don't want to accidentally move things outside of the actual possible location, but of course we'll be culling things out anyways. So as long if you're fine with things kind of hanging off the table, but not being completely off the table, then you can put it closer to the edge. You'll play around with it and you kind of you'll get the hang of it as you do this. I found something a little bit inwards does the trick quite well. So we'll do something like this. And then in the tag here under advanced for the socket, I'm going to give it the tag curve. And then all I'm going to do is duplicate the socket, move it over here, and then duplicate two more times to put it inside of the four sections like this, because this will be our area. And I've done this for the two other tables that you see right over here and this one here. All of them have the same tag of curve, and I've gone ahead and put all the points slightly inwards right where we want it. So now what do we do with them? Well, we're going to need to loop on every single mesh, get those points, create a spline from them, and then use the spline to also sample it on interior and spawn things inside of it. That does mean that this doesn't work just for tables. You could do this with anything, put the points where you want it to create a spline from them and then set it up. So let me show you how that's all done. We'll get started with creating a simple PCG loop graph for this. So we'll create a PCG loop underscore mesh socket to spline, and then we'll open it up. The input and output here are very simple. The input is just a simple loop of a points with a required pin status, and the output is just a normal point that is status of normal. So all we need to do is drag this out a little bit to make room for ourselves. And then from the input, I'll drag out and search for get attribute from point index. The attribute we want to do is we want to get the mesh. Now we're already using the mesh attribute to spawn. So the input source being last is fine. We just need to get the mesh attribute here. So we type in mesh in the output attribute name. And now we want to get the socket information. To do that, here in the top left, grab the execute blueprint and drag it out. And then in the detail panel, from the blueprint element type, select the drop down and then search for socket. That will get you mesh socket to points. So go ahead and select it and then open up the mesh socket to points. And you'll have the static mesh as an input. Well, the attribute out is the static mesh that goes in. And now we have that automatically being populated. Now, still in the mesh sockets to points, we have to change one other thing, which is select the tag. The tag, we've called it curve. So we want to make sure it's typed exactly the same. And now the mesh socket to points is set up. So this gets us the four points. So from here, I can drag out and search for create spline. It's going to take our points and create a spline out of them. Now we do want to change some things here. We want to make sure it is a closed loop and we want to make sure it is linear. You can leave it on create data only as we don't need the actual spline in the world. We want to make sure it's linear. Otherwise, effectively, you'll be making a circle with four points or an oval or something like that. Depending on the shape of your table or whatever you're making, maybe you do want it to be curved, but I find it it's a little bit easier to imagine where it's going to be if you leave it as linear and just maybe add some more points because you don't need to have four points. You can have three, 10, whatever you want. As long as you have a area inside of it, this will all work. So from here, all we need to do is use a spline sampler, just like we did before. We need to change it from on spline to on interior, make sure unbounded is checked on. And I'm just gonna hard code this one to be 30, the interior sample spacing and interior border sample spacing. You can of course have this be as an input and connect it up. And you do that the same way you set it up on the previous loop in this tutorial. But now that we have this, we need to make sure that it's in the correct location. So from here, I'll drag out of the spline sampler and search for copy points. And that is going to go into our source and our target is going to be our original point. And then all we need to do is plug the copy points into the output. And that's all we need for this. Nice and simple. 
So if we go back to the PCG tables graph, now we can continue off of here. So now here, after the static mesh spawner, I'm going to re-merge all the points using a simple merge points node. And then I'm going to partition them one more time. I use an attribute partition. And instead of setting this one to be index, I'm going to be setting it to mesh. So now it has been separated out into data by mesh instead of by index, which is what we had before. From here, I can go ahead and drag in the mesh sockets to spine node and select loop one more time, plug the attribute partition into it. And then I can already do a static mesh spawner and then add a simple mesh entry for our plate, just like so. And now if we take a look here, you can see, well, there you go. We have plates on the tables now. They're all exactly the same. Every single table here is exactly the same. And you can see this one actually didn't spawn anything because I think I put it a little bit too close. So let's actually modify this one. If we need to, we can always go back here and move them a little bit over. You can put them all the way in the corners if we want to. We just need to do a cleanup and generate. And now you can see we have the plates again. And now I've gone ahead and just tinted the plates. So you can really see them much easier as they were slightly blending in. So to give it some variation, all we need to do is use a transform points after this mesh socket to spline. So I'll grab myself the transfer points node and I'm going to slightly offset them. The offset min will be minus 10 in X and Y and the max will be positive 10 in X and Y. And I want them to spin around 360 degrees because even though they're currently circular, maybe the thing you're doing is not perfectly circular. So it'll give some variation. It'll also even break up some repeating patterns if you see something on the texture, like a crack or something like that. Now this has a, a possibility of putting your plate outside of the table. So a way to get, get around that is from here to use an intersection node and the primary source will be the transform points and the source one that's gonna check with is going to be the original mesh socket to spline output. From here, I just wanna prune any that are overlapping. So I'm gonna do first a bounds modifier. I'm gonna change the bounds to something like 0.65 in all axes. So it's gonna give them slightly smaller bounds. As I found, this is a little bit better for these plates. And then all we need to do is grab a self pruning node and plug that into the static mesh spawner. And now if we take a look, you could see, well, there you go. We have plates on the desk and you can see they're all different. Each one, even these ones have two, some have one, other has three here, two. So now we are populating the plates as much as we want here. If we want to have more, for example, we can tweak the bounds modifier here to kind of prune a little bit less by changing to 0.5. But you have to be careful that if you go quite small here, it will start to overlap. But now at 0.5, you can see we have quite a few more plates. And if I want to, I can go to the PCG graph here and change the seed and we'll get different setup for tables, different amount of plates on here at different locations. So again, this can be done for anything. You have shelves, you have anything else. You could absolutely use this method. Keep in mind that if you have like multiple shelves, you might need to do multiple mesh to socket loops based on different tags. Because if you have two shelves, both using the same curve tag, then it will think all of them are together. And so it will try to kind of make a actual loop from the first one to the second one. Now that you could always do something like split it up based on the number of them. You always have four per. There's lots of options on where to take this, but now you have the ability to do and the knowledge to do so. So this is pretty much takes two of my one year old tutorials and brings them up to date with the current PCG knowledge and information that is out there to hopefully make your guys easier and using this in other projects. Now, as always, the project files for this will be available on Patreon, where you can join these wonderful people here in supporting what I do. It really means a lot. And if you'd like to join the community, the link to the Discord will be down below as always. And if you want to learn some more awesome PCG stuff, check out this video right over here for another awesome PCG tutorial.